This is an extract from The Threads of Life, which is a book I'm writing about the social and political uh, significance of sewing. Uh, this, I'm going to read an extract from Chapter 3, which is about memory. Scotland, 2012. My husband's Aunt Jean has decided to rent out her parents' house in Perthshire, unfurnished. She was left it when they died, but she has been living in Wales for many years now. Wales has become home. It's unlikely she will return to Scotland. It is time to give up her guardianship for all the house contains. She will clear it of memories, save what should be saved from the careless hands of tenants. She enlists the help of my husband Charlie to trawl through its contents. They separate the worthless from the valuable with a small allowance for sentiment. The worthless is destined to skip, the valuable to be kept for an auctioneer to survey and take what might sell. After four days she returns to Wales and leaves the attic for my husband and me to clear. We can, she says, take anything we like. It is strange to go into a house robbed of its normality, a home with the cusp of becoming just a house. Everything that made it home still present but misplaced, huddled in piles of dislocation. There are books that once were in order on the shelves, now pillared on the floor. There are toppling towers of crockery, clustered on tabletops, a drawer of old kitchen utensils cushioned on the drawing room sofa, a long silence in a gong skulking in a corner. The life here seems to have been a surprisingly opulent one. There's an aura of a gentility of past soirees, of servants and supper parties, all now gently erased. Porcelain cups like saucers, engraved and fluted wine glass are clouded in dust. Elaborate dinner services are incomplete, the gleam of box cutlery dimmed. It is all too grand for our little house. I pick out an enamel bread bin and a plain green jug which will do justice to a posy of garden flowers. These we will keep. We pull down the attic steps and go up. There seems to be little here, a few, a few cardboard boxes of books, an old trunk tucked up under the cobwebbed eaves, the acrid smell of mice pee. I open up the trunk. Neatly folded, one obscuring the other, is a tightly packed trove of textiles. I bring them out into the light again, damask napkins, their woven chain revealing floats of flowers. A deeply fringed cream silk shawl embroidered in cascades of roses. An entire gypsy outfit, its black velvet bodice jingling with golden coins. A fur-trimmed tribal coat of rich brocade, a set of placemats in delicate turquoise boil, each embroidered with pagodas and men and camels. There are half a dozen Victorian baby dresses ghost white, their bordery anglaise ruffles still, starped, start, still sharp with starch. They look unworn, the keepsakes of a mother whose child never was. I unfold a long stiff apron with a cr red cross stitched to its bib, part of the regulation uniform of a First World War nurse which Charlie thinks must have belonged to his great-aunt. And another apron of hers, its bib inserted with lace. Later, we find a photograph of great-aunt Mame wearing the vest this very apron. She is young, her eyes dreamy with possibility, her hair swept up in fastidious curls, her hands demurely fastened on her lap. At the bottom of the trunk, below hand-stitched and lace-edged tablecloths, bags of tatting, linen-covered books of silk embroidery threads, tea cosies and a seasonal shift of flowers, at the very bottom, lying drowsy in its own warmth, is a vast patchwork quilt. I thought of the woman who made it, sitting scattered on occasional chairs, placed where they could to best catch the afternoon light, or grouped round the table evening candlelight, clustered together, talking of village life and the future of the bride-to-be. Perhaps she stitched too, thinking of independence, of childbirth, of which cupboard should house the linen, of what else she might have made of her life if she wasn't destined for marriage and motherhood. The quilt is perfectly worked in a wonder of tiny finger figured cotton hexagrams, pale browns and apricots, faded p pinks and fragile blues. I do a rough count. There are over 6,000 pieces. That means over 6,000 hexagrams drawn and cut out of paper Another 6,000 slightly larger hexagrams, hexagrams drawn and cut out of assorted fabric. Each and every fabric hexagram folded over its companion piece of paper and stitched to it, each of its eight corners tucked neatly in, a fiddly, fiddly and fastidious task. 
Only when the 6,000 hexagrams are individually complete can assembly begin, each side of each hexagram sewn to another with meticulous care, on the reverse, edge to edge, in tiny stitches, to ensure strength in its density. Such an intensity of stitches is vital if the quilt is not to break apart in the endless lifting and folding of its weight as it does its duty over the many years ahead. Once all the hexagrams are stitched together, 6,000 or more, in a repeating pattern called Grandmother's Garden, the stitches that held the paper in place can be unpicked and the paper removed. Only then can the quilt be backed and pressed and boarded and binding, ready to smooth over the high large bed covering the lovemaking, the conceiving, the sleeping, the recuperating, the dying of my husband's family, generation upon generation. We take the quilt back to our own home with the jug and the enamel bread bin. I lay the quilt in our bed and smooth down the memories it holds as if I am pressing seeds into newly raked earth so they can root and tangle into our lives to make a meadow of family history.